folks hear me okay? Somebody nod? Terrific. So good morning, everyone in Ireland and on the continent. Sorry, good afternoon to everyone in Ireland and on the continent, and good morning to folks in the United States. Uh, greetings from sunny Frederick, Maryland. My name is Garrett Knapp. I am the director of the National Center for Smart Growth at the University of Maryland and College Park. This is the fourth event as part of ICLRD's monthly webinar series on post-pandemic planning for placemaking, a series that has run from May and will conclude next month. Details of all the previous events are to be found on the ICLRD, ICLRD webpage, www.iclrd.org. Today's event is being held, excuse me, Today's event is being held in partnership with the National Center for Smart Growth at the University of Maryland College Park. Um, the National Center for Smart Growth is a research center at the University of Maryland. We are one of three organizations that make up the leadership of the ICLRD. By way of housekeeping, today's event is being live streamed through Maynooth University Social Science Institute's Facebook page. A copy of the recording together with the speaker presentations will be available on the ICRD, ICLRD website shortly. Uh, that URL is www.iclrd.org. Uh, if you're tweeting today, please use the following hashtag, pound ICLRD webinar, uh, no spaces, no caps. So by way of introduction, in terms of today's events, one of the most significant transformations in the socioeconomic geography of Ireland in recent decades has been evident in the changing geographies of population and employment, which have brought about a new spatial relationship between homes and workplaces. This transformation has been led by the restructuring of the economy and the switch shift in employment towards high technology manufacturing and knowledge intensive services. While the phenomenon of commuting has grown rapidly, research on its impacts as distinct from its drivers or causes has failed to keep pace. More recently, COVID-19 has been a major disruption, disruptor in all our lives, as you all well know. The global pandemic has dramatically changed the activity patterns of individuals and families, transforming everyday geographies and the scale at which we live our lives. The implications for places and communities are potentially profound. The two-year in-place research project led by our ICLRD responds to this gap in our understanding. The in-place project is examining the effects of out-commuting on small settlements using a case study approach focused on selected communities from across the island of Ireland, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland and the state of Maryland in the United States. This webinar offers initial re reflections from the first phase of this research program, focusing on three small towns across the island of Ireland and two small towns in Maryland. Analyzing fieldwork conducted in the midst of COVID-19 pandemic, including two periods of lockdown and reopening, the research aims to unpack the complexity of the impacts of pre and post COVID commuting on the economic, social, and spatial characteristics of commuter towns and identify key policy domains where emerging issues identified through this fieldwork has relevance. We have three great speakers uh, today. Um, I will introduce them shortly, but very quickly, uh, we have Dr. Gavin Rafferty, who is a lecturer in spatial planning and development. We have Dr. Karen Keebney, who is the head of rural development in uh, at uh, UCD. And we have Mr. Jesse Bargely, who's a graduate student in community planning. Uh, but before we get to these presentations, uh, sorry, after we have these presentations, we will have a short period of questions and answers. Um, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the question and answer tab uh, at any time during the presentation, but we're not entertaining questions until all the speakers are done. So first, uh, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce uh, Ms. Mary McIntyre, um, who is the chair of the ICLRD, to, open, to offer a few opening welcoming remarks. Mary, please. Thank you, Garrett, and good afternoon to everyone uh, in my time zone, and good morning to uh, any colleagues listening from the other side of the Atlantic. As Garrett said, I am the chair of ICLRD, 
ICLRD is an independent charity set up in 2006 to explore the contribution that spatial planning and the development of social, uh, economic and environmental infrastructure could make to the development of uh, peace and reconciliation on the island of Ireland and elsewhere. And one of our key objectives is to strengthen the policy and operational linkages between central, regional or local government policymakers and practitioners. The topic for today, obviously looking at commuting people in place, I think is so relevant. And whilst it's straddled COVID, again, I think that's really interesting because prior to COVID, you know, nobody could obviously could foresee a situation where we'd have, you know, working from home. During COVID, there was a, an expectation that we'd never all go back to working the way we were and that commuting was finished. Hopefully we're post-COVID now and things are starting to change again. Um, but I suppose that the future still is uncertain in terms of work patterns. But as Garrett said, over the past decades, the whole pattern of commuting in Ireland has completely changed. And I was thinking about even just from a uh, you know, personal point of view, I can remember my grandfather who was uh, a librarian and he, he walked to work every day of his life from his house about 50 yards across the square to the library where he worked. My father walked to work about a mile and a half to his place of work. I, on the other hand, have commuted by car virtually all my professional life. Uh, first of all, across the city of Manchester, which was a challenge, and then across Northern Ireland. And it was only in the last three years prior to my retirement when I was working in the city centre of Belfast and I chose to live in the city centre of Belfast that I had the luxury of walking to work and uh, gave me a real insight into um, active travel, for one, and the luxury of uh, literally living five minutes from my place of work. But Ireland is a, is a country that's completely car dependent. And if we had any doubts about that, there was a report came out this week saying that we were the second most uh, depend, car dependent nation in the EU, with 76% of people using the car for their main daily trips and that car usage had actually increased in the last three years. Now, all of that has an impact on places. Obviously, a, a huge level of out commuting has impacts on small places where the commuting originates, but also on the places where uh, the people are commuting to. So this study, which started prior to COVID, I'm really interested now to hear today from, from our three speakers, uh, the interim findings of the research and, and what it's showing and how we can learn from this in terms of uh, the patterns of commuting and the impact that it's having on places and then what that means in terms of policy makers and decision makers as we go forward. And I really would like to express the appreciation of everyone in ICLRD to Garrett, to Gavin, Karen, and to Jesse for giving up their time and contributing to today. And I look forward to a really uh, interesting series of presentations and uh, look forward to the learning uh, that we're all going to have this afternoon. So thank you very much. Thanks, Mary. Uh, really welcome those comments. And uh, certainly I want to thank you for your leadership of, of ICLID uh, over the past uh, several years. Uh, and of course, we take, we take second to nobody in terms of car dependence. Uh, I saw a study today that, that showed how uh, telecommuting was up, but public transit ridership was significantly down. So uh, this is a, a, an issue that we share with our, with our Irish brethren. So uh, I'm pleased to introduce uh, our first speaker, uh, Dr. Gavin Rafferty. Uh, he has a, a lot of degrees and a lot of initials behind his name. Uh, he is also a lecturer in spatial planning and development at the Belfast School of Architecture in the Built Environment at Ulster University. His research interests include healthy urban planning, inclusive engagement, and the relationship between spatial planning, community planning, uh, public service delivery. He is currently the co-investigator on the InPlace project, and we look forward to hearing from Gavin what this project is all about and what we hope to learn from it. Take it away, please, Gavin. Thanks, Garrett. Um, and thanks, Mary, for the broader introduction on the project as well. I'm just going to share my screen here with everyone. 
So in addition to what really Garrett has said, I'm kind of my role today is to just elaborate a bit on that, set a bit more context um, for those of you that maybe haven't joined previous webinars on this research project is kind of bringing everyone up to speed on just what the, the aims and objectives are or methodology and the logic behind that. But in addition, really, it's to try and set the scene for what's going on in academic literature that our project is contributing to and adding to that conversation and what ideas and concepts and arguments that we're using to, to interrogate our uh, data that we're finding. And also to highlight some of the policy domains that this project relates to, and you'll see that uh, uh, connecting with some of the empirical work, uh, the findings, if you like, from our colleagues, Karen and Jesse, when they present after and myself. So really on this first slide, I want to just acknowledge our research partners, as Garrett and others have alluded to. We've got a team on the island of Ireland. So many of us, I'm not going to read out everyone's name, uh, and research assistants, as well as our colleagues and counterparts uh, in the United States and the University of Maryland. But also I want to highlight and thank our research funders, as you'll see them listed there in terms of the Department for Housing, Local Government and Heritage, the Office of the Planning Regulator, the also the Local Government and Management Agency, um, Clare County Council, also uh, Maryland Trans Department of Transportation, and also the Department for Infrastructure based in Northern Ireland. We're very appreciative of the funding and also their input in terms of um, guiding the project in its early stages. So in terms of the um, research context, obviously Garrett has, has mentioned some of this in relation to the changing environment in which we're operating within pre-COVID. Commuting has been an increasingly a predominantly uh, predominant feature, um, both in the island of Ireland and the United States, in terms of volume of commuting, the distance of commuting, and the time spent commuting, which is of particular interest to us. It's been a major phenomenon, obviously, growing pre-COVID. Uh, we've had uh, this quite quite a, an unusual circumstances, uh, I feel like, in terms of having a laboratory in which to test what a no-COVID increased telecommuting environment has looked like with COVID. Um, and has really drawn significant insights into what that will mean for potentially future development of places and, and policies that guide placemaking and employment going forward and other policy domains. In many ways, the, uh, the changing relationship between workplaces and home is an outworking of uh, economic growth and the guidance around policy uh, that shift the development of where land uses are. And so therefore there's a, there's a mismatch, if you like, or a uh, um, a disconnection between employment markets and housing markets that's throwing up questions for what that means in the future and how do we maybe address some of that in terms of any initial findings that we're getting in terms of the impact of long duration commuting. Well, I suppose with, with COVID-19, it's been um, an opportunity to, to explore what that means for uh, in terms of the individual, um, the commuter uh, that has been uh, been able to telecommute to work, and also what it means for, and more importantly for us in the project, it means for places and placemaking, and indeed the embeddedness of that individual in that particular locality in which they reside. And so you know, we're looking at where this is temporary, the long-term shifts of this, and the lessons that we can learn for planning and placemaking. So the aim of our project, as Garrett has referred to, is to really investigate that impact of commuting, especially that long duration out commuting. Um, that is what we're defining as 45 minutes or more based on the international literature that clearly defines a 45 minute commute or under is bearable, but beyond that is something that is potentially problematic for the commuter. Uh, and that's the, the threshold we've set. So we're looking at places on the island of Ireland and also in, in uh, United States on these longer commutes and their impact not exclusively just on people while that's important but it's wider impact than on place and that will become clear as we move through the presentation so to achieve that in the various objectives that we're, we're undertaking is to map and quantify the scale of pre and if you like during and post commuting uh, covid commuting on their case study locations also to look at demographics, community dynamics, and the spatial patterns of development in those case study areas. Also particularly to assess the impacts of pre and post commuting patterns on, on places and to identify good practice as well. All of which is to uh, provide some policy insights uh, going forward. 
So here on this slide, you'll see the identification of the case study locations, both in the island of Ireland and also in Maryland, uh, with those case study areas um, in phase one that Karen will be reporting on earlier. That's Dundrum, also uh, Newtown Mount Kennedy and Ennis Diamond La Hinch, um, where empirical work will be based on today, but also to note that there, there are phase two case study locations in the Isle of Ireland that will be commencing with uh, this month. Also that in the United States, there are two um, in the state of Maryland, um, um, Middletown and also um, North Beach, which Jesse will speak to the findings later. And to say that the case study selections, we have uh, spent quite a bit of time earlier on in the project selecting criteria in terms of settlement size, uh, so there's compar they're comparable both in the island of Ireland and also the United States case studies. Uh, and also looking at several variables such as um, uh, the duration of commute, obviously, socioeconomic uh, status, level of education, mode of transport, etc. So that we're able to inform the right selection of case study times. So the research design uh, it really is adopting this case study approach where we're getting much more in-depth understanding of the particular settlements that we've identified using that methodology of uh, selection criteria. So the settlements, uh, obviously in Ireland, Northern Ireland, the Republic, of, or sorry, in, in, in Maryland, um, experience a high level of out commuting on a daily basis. Um, and actually there's some interesting findings around uh, the extent to which that's happening on a, on a daily basis and questioning the the, the way we conceive and understand commuting um, as maybe a different pattern, um, uh, temporal pattern to that. Um, so the second, I suppose, aspect here is that the communities are of comparable sizes and population, and also the, uh, the uh, commuting uh, duration of 45 minutes has been quite significant in us selecting uh, those case studies approach. In addition to that selection process, a key thing of this in-depth um, case study analysis is really to try and identify area profiles. So using uh, lots of demographic data that's very available to map that using particular GIS software. Also to, to undertake a policy analysis and literature review, which I'll refer to later. Um, again, to really get to that um, enriched understanding of those places is to undertake uh, interviews and focus groups with commuters and other key stakeholders in these settlements as well as undertake a survey, which we'll be hearing about some of the findings later, which incorporates, uh, which some of you might uh, be aware of, the place standard tool, um, which identifies key policy areas and domains that are interested in the built environment and beyond in terms of, I suppose, wider uh, service delivery and understanding of how places evolve. And finally, to identify uh, best practice examples, uh, something that we'll be we'll continue doing alongside these other strands. So in the time remaining, I want to really highlight some of the key um, bodies of literature that we've looked at and investigated and in to start to inform our thinking as the researchers on the project. Um, and acknowledge contribution of many other researchers in the team that have been uh, helping to prepare this. Um, and I suppose the key thing, as you can see in the diagram here, is that there are three main bodies of literature, if you like, that we've been investigating to um, shape the understanding of the project and also the, I suppose, the way we analyze the findings that we hear about later. So obviously there's a body of literature around commuting in terms of how that um, is understood and the factors that are influencing it around car ownership, uh, along, along with the, the labour demands and supply side. Also accompanying that is the understanding around COVID-19 and its impact on commuting, as well as the growth prior to uh, COVID-19 around tele-working and tele-commuting, which is slightly nuanced in terms of understanding of those. But I suppose the, the body, other body of literature is around well-being and the growth around subjective well-being of individuals, but also factors that link very much to, to, to community level, such as um, social capital, if you will, and social relationships, um, which are important. And also the role then of placemaking and planning and the various attributes attached to that in terms of land use activities, assets, um, and community infrastructure. But I suppose where you see the the interesting overlaps between these bodies of literature is where our project really tries to provide a much richer understanding and also add to uh, some of the gaps that, he, that are in the literature 
um, if you like, the interrelationship between commuting and well-being is that there, there's, there is a definite understanding and articulation from the international literature that there's substantial negative impact on subjective well-being for the commuter, and that may well be around physical mental health, um, also things like a decline in physical activity, and generally a lower um, subjective well-being articulated in surveys. Um, also, with some researchers identifying a significant reduction in leisure time or life satisfaction associated with commuting. The, the overlap between the impact of commuting and well-being and also the, the place dynamics raises certain questions and um, particularly relationships to its impact on the social well-being more collectively in, in a place. So not just the individual, but as Putman argues, this sort of commuting spillover effect is really is, I think, where our project is, is quite interested in finding to what extent does commuting um, and the impact of, of commuters commuting long distances have a spillover effect in communities, in settlements, how they evolve, uh, and the sort of fabric of them, the social and then indeed physical fabric of those places. So we're really keen on looking at um, the, the place qualities and the impact of commuting on place, um, and not just the individual as, as much of the existing academic research has investigated. We are we're keen to look at um, the extent to which long commutes, uh, not just will have a negative impact on life satisfaction and the individual uh, commuting, but the spillover effect on these places, and indeed to the extent to which long duration community impacts on the quality and on the future development of place. Indeed, hence you can see relationships to why we're looking at things like the place standards. So I think that the key contribution of our project is to add to the understanding of its of community's impact on place. Yeah, can I interrupt you for just one second? Sure. Uh, there's a comment in the question and answer that the presentation slides are not visible. Is there oh. someone who can help with that? Yeah, probably maybe Anne could help with that. Um, I I think they are for everybody. I can see them clearly. Um, I'm going to turn on the chat for a second. If anyone else has that issue, can you let me know? Okay, maybe it's a... Maybe it's just isolated to one or two. Isolated problem. Yeah, I think I think if you're watching on a phone you, or an, a tablet, you just need to swipe the side and you should be able to see them. All right, sorry to interrupt, Devin. Yeah, hey, okay. Hopefully that can be resolved for you who's having the problem. Um, so finally, moving on from the academic literature, I suppose what I want to end with in my presentation is to highlight some of the key policy domains that are relevant for this research and will connect into some of the findings that Karen and Jesse are, are, are referring to um, from the relevant case studies and also add, I suppose, to relevant uh, conversations and the Q&A later. Obviously, uh, particularly in the island of Ireland context, the national and regional um, levels of policy, particularly in planning, but um, more broadly in spatial development, are, are have always been arguing a bit more balanced regional development. And I suppose what we're finding in the project and what we'll, we'll find in debate will inform that conversation around maybe future um, uh, best practice or ways of trying to achieve regional development, uh, more balanced regional development. Indeed, linked to that, the idea of more compact growth in terms of maybe um, reusing existing uh, urban areas within rural areas or in a more sustainable ruralism in terms of supporting that um, and the growth there, but also it links to the public transportation infrastructure, indeed potential land use changes, raises questions around digital um, uh, infrastructure and connectivity uh, on the island of Ireland, and indeed there's huge implications for uh, a decline in commuting and a potential growth in telecommuting to um, uh, respond to the challenges of climate change and the low carbon uh, transitioning um, in our society. And indeed also thinking about the health of our places in terms of creating healthier places, more active travel arguably, in terms of um, new ideas that might be emerging around remote working, but also the health of a place in terms of contributing to the local economy and the asset de and development of those places. Okay, locally, what were you know, the policy implications and alignment there would be around quality of life, or some might see or express that as well being both of the individual, or i.e., the commuters, um, but also more collectively at a, at a settlement level, if you like, at a community level. And also, clearly for us in our project, um, is the qualities of place domains at a local level in terms of the housing provision. Um, 
again, the spatial dynamics around that, where is it located in relation to employment markets and also uh, the extent to which that influenced people's um, ability to reside there uh, and be located in those, those settlements. But also locally around maybe transport mobility issues, uh, the working economy, um, ideas around building stronger social inclusion and cohesion, and indeed social capital in those communities, um, in terms of and to what extent that's impacted by commuting, and generally the sense of place. And indeed, what is very interesting for us, since you'll hear about arguably through the presentations, is that the the significance of the natural environment uh, for 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 commuters as well as as those living in those locations that we've we've identified. So I'll hand back to uh, Garrett to introduce her, her next speakers, but that provides a bit of context to uh, what we'll hear later uh, in terms of the findings. Thank you, Gavin. It's off to a great start. So with uh, no pause, let me let me turn to the next speaker. So our next speaker is Dr. Karen Kivney. She is an assistant professor and head of rural development in the School of Agriculture and Food Science at University College Dublin and a senior research associate of ICLRD. She's currently the PI, principal investigator for the Irish Research Council funded project, Citizen Rural, Digital Data for Participatory Democracy in Remote Places. Previously, Karen was a lecturer in rural spatial planning at Queen's University, Belfast. Karen, take it away. Thanks, Garrett. Um, thank you, and Gavin has, um... I'm just putting my timer on there because I over talk. Uh, Gavin has set the context for the study, um, which, as he said, is looking at Ireland and Maryland. I'll be looking at um, our island of Ireland case study areas in this. So he set the methodology out. So I'll go directly into the findings. My slides move on for me. So today I'll be looking at perceptions of place looking at place of work pre-COVID and currently. I'll also be talking about commuting times and the changes and implications of those changes and also highlighting some of the data that we've extracted on social capital at the local place level. Gavin's already gone through the criteria, but just as a reminder, I'm only looking at phase one here and I'm specifically looking at Ennis Diamond Le Hinch in County Fair, Newtown, Mount Kennedy, and then um, count and Dundrum then um, in, in Down. So in terms of what I'm presenting today, I'll be looking at some of the findings from the questionnaire. Uh, over the past year, we have uh, distributed a questionnaire online in the three communities. Now, Ennis Diamond Le Hinch, would be identified as our non-commuter area. We have that just for comparison to see how, um, how a place varies or changes depending on levels of commuting. And, and you'll see some interesting things come out in the data as I, I go through the slides. We've also um, conducted, administered the questionnaire in Newtown and Kennedy and in Dundrum. And there are response rates there. And I'll also be peppering some of that data with the qualitative findings from the interviews of which we've conducted 35 in total among the study areas. So looking at some of the data, it, Gavin ended looking at some of the local issues that we're really interested in. And I think what makes our study um, different is that we're looking at commuting, not just at the travel, but actually at the impact on the places in which those commuters live. And this uh, slide here shows the place standard tool, which is a tool we've applied in the uh, surveys. And it really looks at how respondents and how those residents that live in the study areas perceive the place in which they live. And they rate it based on the various values and their perception of the level of those places. So what we found striking was that uh, generally, the, regardless of the area, there was a dissatisfaction with housing, it was more likely to be dissatisfied with housing, but higher satisfaction with the natural environment, as Gavin mentioned, and also low levels of satisfaction with public transport and traffic and parking. So it was interesting just to see how these played out in some of the data. So I'll be, I'll be looking at, at some of this as we go on. 
In addition to that survey, which is to a large extent quantitative data, we're also analyzing the qualitative interviews. And this is just an example of some of the work we're doing. This is a circle graph, really trying to look at similarities between the places um, and, and or sorry, bet between the language that people are using in the different places and the linkages of what linkages are they actually making with the language when they talk about commuting, what else is coming up quite, quite clearly among the different places. And, and that's throwing out some interesting things and really giving a, a depth and a richness to the quantitative data that we have collected. So some of the areas I want to highlight today is, for example, just looking at currently where people, their, their place of work or home. Unsurprisingly, um, because Ennis Diamond Lahinch was our low commuter area, uh, what, what stands out there is that majority of respondents are working in the town in which they live. But in contrast then to Dundrum and Newtown Mount Kennedy, the majority of people are commuting above 16 kilometres or more. And depending on the locality, uh, that distance, the, the time spent commuting can be up, up to and above 45 uh, minutes for that commute. Also in Dundrum and Newtown Mount Kennedy, um, and to a slightly lower extent in Ennestime and Lahinch, um, around a fifth of people are working from home. So interestingly, while Dundrum and Newtown and Kennedy are high commuter areas, there is also a, lar a large percentage of our respondents are working from home. We asked in the survey about place of work um, or study pre and post COVID. And in the red to your left is the pre-COVID um, data, and then blue to your right is what people are doing now. And really what stood out was the, the increase in those working from home as a remote worker or connected worker. You can see pre-COVID, we were just over 5%, and again, now nearly a fifth of, of our respondents are working from home in some capacity, and that's a big impact. And correspondingly, you can see the number of people or the percentage of people commuting above 16 kilometers has reduced to a certain extent. And people in the interviews talk about that impact of commuting pre-COVID and also the positive nature of not having to commute on a daily basis. And one respondent from Dundrum talked about that darkness. I was thinking this quote feels a little bit relevant today in particular, um, but and, and as we go into our, our darker winter months, I, I, I thought this one was quite relevant. We can relate to it. So once the clocks changed, you were leaving in the pitch dark and you were coming home in the dark. You could leave work at home and it was already dark. So by the time you got home and had your dinner, you're maybe talking it's nearly eight o'clock and the day is done. And that quote, I think, highlights a lot of things in this study in terms of people's well-being and also their ability to engage in other activities outside of work once the working day was done. And, and again, I'll, I'll, I have some slides around that in a few minutes. So we also broke down the change in home working um, around selected cohorts. So we looked at the gender differences and also level of educational attainment. So for uh, women and men, there was always a percentage working from home. It's lower, around 6% of women were working from home uh, before COVID with over 8% of men working from home at the same time. And that's increased for both cohorts. Males still uh, are in the majority or a higher level when working from home, but now almost a fifth um, are working from home. Interestingly, educational attainment has an impact. And where 0% of our respondents who had attained a secondary educa education were working from home pre-COVID, that had risen to 10% during COVID and, and now that's still, we're still in that, uh, I don't know whether it's post COVID, but we're, we're still in that COVID period uh, now. So what, what is striking for us is that what we find in the literature is people who work from home are more likely to have a higher educational attainment, but it was opening opportunities for people with lower levels of educational attainment. Unsurprisingly, based on the literature, persons with postgraduate education were, commute, were working from home at about 7%, but that's risen to almost a quarter of our respondents uh, during and now um, with COVID. 
And people talked about remote working quite a bit in the interviews. And while we would say for the most part, there was a lot of positivity, there was also a negative, some negatives around the connection with work where people were feeling they were more connected with their locality. There was some sense of being disconnected from work. So one respondent talked about the, the only disadvantage being that their connection with work. So they really felt they had to make an effort to go down and connect with individuals and make sure that I'm connecting with teams with the company. So I'm not isolating myself. And in terms of just sitting out there and being forgotten about and forgetting about the culture and what the experience of work is. So while we found positives in terms of people being more engaged with their community, they also had concerns about what was happening with work. In terms of change in time spent commuting by town, um, again, unsurprisingly, Ennis Diamond, Le Hinge, for the most part, stayed the same because the majority of people are working locally. But for uh, Dundrum and Newtown, Mount Kennedy, around 35% in Dundrum and over 40% in Newtown, Mount Kennedy had a shorter or reduced or actually eliminated their commute altogether. So that's quite um, a, a large proportion of people that have had a, a major change to their daily or weekly working lives in either reducing or eliminating their commute altogether. We also looked at satisfaction with commute by mode of travel. And this was on a scale of one to 10, 10 being most satisfied. Walking and cycling was found, people had the most satisfaction with that commute. But while public transport, which is obviously, you know, there's a lot of incentives now to encourage people to use public transport, people found that the least satisfactory. And again, what was coming out in interviews and in the surveys was that idea of if you can't control the times. We had some interesting kind of stuff come up in the interviews about people saying, well, I, can't, I couldn't control the time that I left, that, left for work or I had to wait for a bus to go home. So therefore, they, it was easier to uh, drive, to learn to drive, to go as a car passenger or to drive a car by themselves as well. So I think that, that I think it's, it's important to, to look at that one that, Walking and cycling was the one they could control the most and therefore were almost more sat was satisfied. And that obviously has imp implications for health and well-being. Public transport, people found more frustrating um, and even never mind to talk about availability of public transport. And here again in the interviews, um, quite a lot of people talked about transport, transportation, travel, traveling. And they talked about lack of good access, lack of facilities, even bus shelters, that things like that came out. And they talked more about what put them off using public transport ports. And obviously, if they're at a distance, they felt they couldn't walk or cycle, so had very little choice but to, to drive a car. Um, and people also talked about how housing interacted with traffic and transport. So, for example, in Newtown Mount Kennedy, the, one of our respondents talked about housing has increased and generally people were happy with housing in Newtown because there was a lot more housing there compared to other places. But there but there was obviously then the corresponding uh, issue with traffic and again, talking about housing, but not coming with the related facilities, be it playgrounds, but also be it more uh, public transport, um, you know, not being able to get on the bus or train and people really not being able to to walk to their place of work because they were living at such a distance from their from their work. So finally, we're what we're very interested in as well is people's engagement and social local social capital in the places that we're looking at now. Gavin highlighted this in from the literature where in, in other places we do find that people who commute are less likely to be engaged locally. We're not finding that as starkly. And that's something we're trying to unpack further. And um, some of sort of the qualitative data is helping that because we are seeing that often people are living in a place because they have a connection to the area already. And so they find it easier to access um, activities. And this is anything from local sports to other voluntary um, activities. So it is interesting just to see that 
we're not finding um, a, the same pattern that we see in other studies coming out in terms of who can um, or who does uh, get involved in local social activities. And interestingly, one of the positives that, came, that comes out from the interviews in the remote working is, is talking about that ease of access. So now that we have the working from home thing, as one of our interviewees calls it, it leaves people with opportunities to do more. You can't expect people to leave their houses at 7 a.m. and come back at 7 p.m. to contribute. So the phenomenon of both members of the family working away from home is so alien to how things used to be. And this respondent really identified there are major changes within the fabric of our community because people have the opportunity to remote work. And interestingly, you know, we looked at how long people had lived in the places and there, def there is a correlation between the length of residence and ability or participation in voluntary work. So those who lived in the in, a, in one of our study areas longer, so in this case, we looked at 11 plus or minus years, those who were living over 11 years plus were more likely to be engaged um, in voluntary participation. And again, that's something we're, we're, we're looking at further and even would welcome feedback here today because it's interesting just to see how people are engaging. It also has to do with family stage and family cycle and ability to, to engage um, with voluntary activities. Um, and, and I always, I thought this was interesting as well, just coming from one of the study areas that really looking at that idea that housing plays a part and actually really people, why they chose to live in a place was actually they were or had some local connection. And again, as I said, that meant people possibly were more likely to engage socially. And often they were choosing to live close to where they were from. So in, in for as an example, for Dundrum, people may have been from Newcastle originally, which is a couple of miles up the road, but found it too expensive to live there. So they had moved out a little bit further to, to Dundrum. And we found really similar incidents, incidences of that in Newtown Mount Kennedy also. So just to conclude, I think what we're finding really is commuting and place and really trying to bring the learnings together about impact of place, really, really complex. We know that long distance commuting is driven by an income, travel, cost trade-off, housing affordability, and then transport and connectivity. And also that we can see where people were, were commuting full-time prior to COVID, there is a negative impact on subjective well-being. We need to unpack that community need further. So really what are the commuters telling us about how they're engaging locally and really the question of does it depend on whether they already had a connection with the place or or what what is their history with the place and also really that we really would identify the commuting practices have significant in, implications for place and we have key questions around the role of remote working about, and how that will operate in future models of work and what does that actually mean for place and obviously also that has major implications for housing policy, climate change and quality of life. So thanks very much and I'll hand back to Garrett. Awesome, thank you so much, Karen. So uh, our third speaker, very, very proud to introduce uh, one of our own, um, introduce Mr. Jesse Bargely. Uh, Jesse is a graduate student in community planning and research assistant at the National Center for Smart Growth. Uh, at the University of Maryland. Prior to undergraduate school, Jesse worked for three years for the city of Providence, Utah. And among other things, he received a BA in Arabic and Middle Eastern studies from Brigham Young University. Uh, and he speaks Korean, who knew? So with that, I'll turn it over to Jesse. I'm here now, thank you, Garrett. And thanks everybody for sticking with us uh, to this point in the presentation. So I'm gonna talk about our case studies here in Maryland. Um, I've been working on the in-place project for about a year. And let me get this. Here we go. So our towns are Middletown, Maryland and North Beach, Maryland. And we're gonna tell you a little bit more about them so that you know where they are and you have some context. Um, so just a little bit of information here. Middletown's population is just under 5,000. 
and North Beach's population is about 2,100. And we've done one, we did a survey and we had about 101 responses in both locations. And we did 10 interviews in both of these locations too. So there's lots of interesting things coming out of this. Um, this presentation, I'm gonna focus on the impacts of COVID and how it's been impacting commuting patterns. So here we have some commuting characteristics of the surrounding areas. And this also shows you where the towns are located. So we have here North Beach on the Chesapeake Bay here, and you have DC and Baltimore. So those are major, major commuting destinations. And then Middletown up here, it's in Frederick County. And what we have here on this map is um, the red kind of redder areas are areas census tracts, which have a higher percent of people commuting more than 45 minutes each way which as we've mentioned, as Gavin mentioned, that's been identified in the literature as an inflection point. So you can sort of see the belts here. Um, you see around DC, there's kind of a commuter belt and around Baltimore, there's a commuter belt as well. So North Beach is on, is pretty much well within that red area. And you can see it has 47% who are commuting more than 45 minutes each way. Uh, Middletown, has 31% and it's on the outer edge of that kind of belt. So one thing I want to get into before we talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, the results that we've found around commuting is the place standard and how much people seem to like these places. So this is also coming out in the interviews as well. People really like these towns, um, especially North Beach in a lot of ways. So you can see here that they're rated very high on a lot of characteristics here. So feeling safe, sense of community, social interaction, play and recreation, the natural environment, they're all pretty high. And North Beach is higher than Middletown on moving around on foot and bike. So that's something that's coming through in the interviews. And I'm just going to give you one example of the kind of quotes that we're getting. So we have a woman here from North Beach um, a, f a female in her 50s who's a meeting prof professional or event planner. And she says, I love living in a small town and I really like the people here. It's a nice mix of people, young and old and everything in between. And I just like the feel. I love being near the water. When we bought this house, we knew it was going to be North Beach if we could. And one other criteria, the top one probably, was that we had to be able to walk to the boardwalk and all the stuff down there. So we have walkability mentioned here, we have nature mentioned here, and these are mentioned quite a bit in the interviews. In fact, every single person we interviewed about North Beach brought up walkability without being prompted. Um, I did those interviews, I didn't even have to ask them. When we asked them about what you like about your town, 10 out of 10 interviews brought up walkability. Um, in Middletown, it was six out of 10. So you can see, there's a lot of positive things about these towns. And I think it's important to remember that uh, as we talk about the commuting patterns and some of the possible implications. So now let's get into the data from our survey. We have commute days per week. So on the left side here, you have zero days per week. And these are all workers or employed people. So, um, Anyway, zero days per week means that they are not commuting to work, but they are working from home. And the blue bar on any of these, like the blue bar here, is pre-pandemic, the red bar is during the pandemic, and the green bar is currently. So you can see that the main trends are that we have a dramatic increase in the percent of people in both towns working zero days per week, or commuting, not working, excuse me, commuting zero days per week and a dramatic decrease in the percent who are commuting five days per week. And then the other days per week, we have you know, a variety of patterns, some increase, some decrease, a decrease here in three days per week. Um, it's not as clear what's going on in those middle number of days, but we do see clearly an increase in the, the percent of people who are telecommuting. And, this is interesting partially because it's above the national average. According to the census in 2021, about 18% of 
of Americans in 2021 were working from home, primar <coughs> excuse me, primarily working from home. So this is above the national average. The average in Washington, D.C. is 48 percent. So it's below the average of Washington, D.C., which these communities kind of orbit. So it's interesting to wonder why they're above the national average, but uh, below the Washington, D.C. average. And we also kind of similarly to what you saw in the Irish data, we looked at education level and the ability to commute uh, from home or to telecommute during the pandemic. So you have here, uh, the blue bar is less than a bachelor's degree and the orange is a bachelor's degree and above. And you can see here that there is a stark difference in both towns between uh, the people, you know, the percent of people who were able to commute from home during the pandemic and based on education. So that was a finding and it's more dramatic in North Beach than in Middletown. So we also asked people, <coughs> excuse me, about their attitudes uh, about remote working. And these are all people who are able to work remotely during the pandemic. So we asked them if they could see themselves continuing to do so in the future. And you can see here that most, the majority did say that they could see themselves working from home in the future in both towns with a, a much higher percentage in North Beach than in Middletown, but still a high percentage in both of them. And we asked them how supportive their employers are of working from home. And you see kind of, that the green is very supportive, the blue is moderately supportive, and that again, North Beach has a higher percent if you add those two together than Middletown, but still both towns are saying that their employers are fairly supportive of working from home. So from the interviews, we've found some interesting stories about how these changes are happening. So I wanted to share some of these with you and I'll just kind of summarize. I won't read all of these quotes verbatim, but this is a North Beach resident um, who's a meeting professional and event planner. And she talks about how the lease came due on their uh, office that they had a five office suite and their, you know, her employer decided to change it to one office so that they can meet together when necessary. Um, so they reduced their office space and they're mostly working from home now. So we also saw an example of residential mobility due to uh, working remotely, which was interesting. This woman who now lives in Middletown, who hasn't lived there very long, she moved there during the pandemic. She said that <clears throat> she's 100%, she was 100% remote during the pandemic. And that was a huge reason they decided to move to Middletown. She believed that they would just keep everybody remote, but it wasn't actually true. She had to uh, end up going into work one day per week, but she says that that's doable. And we also saw stories of hybrid schedules. Um, several more quotes, you know, we have much more that we could share, but because of time, limited to a few here. But this man who works at a factory, he's an engineer for a manufacturing plant. He says he used to do five days a week, and ever since COVID, They've switched to four days and they run their factory for 10 hour days and the office people work from home on Fridays. So again, evidence of how the five day work week is decreasing. So there's some key takeaways and further questions about this data. Um, I think it's pretty interesting. You know, the towns are experiencing telecommuting above the national average. And this, could this be a general trend for towns with high levels of pre-pandemic commuting like these towns have? Um, and if so, why? <laughs> and will towns that are highly regarded, such as these towns where most people seem to like them, experience higher levels of telecommuting because people maybe enjoy staying home? We have a lot of quotes from the interviews we could share about people, especially in North Beach, who just love to take walks on the boardwalk. And it's, you know, potentially possible that that's one reason that they really like to work from home is because they like their place and they like going on walks and <laughs> accessing the restaurants and other things that are there within walking distance. And also, 
How common are experiences like that of the Middletown resident who moved because of telecommuting, because they felt the flexibility to be able to move anywhere? And we only had one kind of anecdote of that in our 20 interviews, but it's possible that that's happening on a significant scale. Um, so those are all things we want to look into, and maybe we will look into some of them in the future. We're still in the data analysis process, but thank you for listening. That's about all I have. Thank you, Jesse. Terrific, uh, ter terrific um, presentations by all three. Thanks so much. So um, let's see what we have by the way of questions. Um, it looks like we have questions about being able to see the slides, but I'm not seeing much else. So let me go ahead and throw out a question while other people are thinking about what to add. I guess my you know one of the one of the interesting things about this project for me is the ability to do this on both sides of the Atlantic. And I wonder if if any of the presentate presenters um, have any comments about you know what might be different, what have we learned, um, how are things different, you know, from Maryland and Ireland, and what might we expect to find uh, different in these two places? I open it up to anybody. <clears throat> I hear no takers. I, I, you, you just opened up to any of us, is it? Yes, please. Um, I think what I mean, there's a few unsurprising things in the sense that we know the high car dependency, and I think that we tend to associate that with the states. Mm -hmm. But in ways, we're not we're not much behind you um, in that sense. Um, I think that it's the social capital side of things that I think we're finding interesting as a research team because we seem in Ireland to be booking the trend on that um, in from the literature. And I think there's also differences in that. But I know we also maybe have different networks of volunteering in Ireland. And, you know, one of the things that comes out very strongly in the Irish setting um, is the GAA, which is, uh, for anybody who isn't familiar, is football. It's a voluntary organization for football and hurling, which is sort of a very traditional sport in Ireland. And one thing with that is people would, I because people are also, obviously, when they're filling out the survey, are self-reporting. So while that might be a sports activity, they could also be volunteering at the club because that is that organization relies to a great extent on voluntary uh, on volunteers um, because it trains kids from uh, like four up to whatever age um, and so it's also a way of maybe families that are new to a place who have a young family to actually get involved because um, I know myself usually you're being asked to volunteer to either stand at a, at a line or just be a, another body there <laughs> supervising but actually, that's a really nice way um, that, you know, for potentially um, kind of it's like a gateway into volunteering in communities um, on the island of Ireland. Um, and that's a nice one that we have a kind of in common across across the island as well. And very and it, and it is coming out in our interviews. It's mentioned sport is mentioned a lot in our interviews. I don't know. Jesse might have other insights or Gavin. Jesse or Gavin. Like Jesse, you want to say something? I was just going to say sports, I don't think particularly came out in our interviews, but nature and access yeah. to nature definitely came out very strong, especially in North Beach, like access to the beach and the boardwalk. Um, and also activities, community activities came out pretty strong. They have like farmers markets and things like that. Gavin, anything to add? No, other than really just the, the, I suppose the similarities there, but the access to nature has struck me particularly and the Island of Ireland case studies and it sort of resonates with just what Jesse has said mm -hmm. um, in not knowing the case study locations intimately prior to us undertaking the research, um, how significant that has been in terms of 
commuters' ability to maybe find these uh, restorative environments, if you want to call them that, the ability to just unwind and connect with them, particularly during COVID, that has really helped those settlements. So it really raises broader questions for places that maybe have commuting um, patterns that are high or commuting generally that haven't got access to those environmental assets. I suppose there's, there's lots of questions stemming from what we're finding that, that we can't answer yet, but raises further questions. So it'll be of interest. So there are a couple of questions now in the Q&A. So the first question is, did you engage with Grow Remote in the Irish research? I see some heads nodding, Karen or Gavin? Yes, indeed we have. Yeah, they are on our uh, advisory group um, in terms of informing um, the shape of the project. And we're, we're obviously um, sharing our findings with them as, as well. So they've been an active uh, player, if you like, uh, an organization in terms of shipping to the project. So yes, the short answer is yes, we've engaged with them, yeah. So for us who are not familiar, could, could you say a, uh, just a word or two about what Grow Remote is? Um, maybe Karen can add a bit better in terms of knowing them more intimately, but other than the idea is to um, encourage the um, and, and sort of advocacy work around promoting um, remote working, uh, basically, uh, to grow that as a, as a concept, as a practice in the island of Ireland, or mainly in the Republic of Ireland, um, in terms of promoting, I suppose, the, the, the revitalization of the rural economy and uh, and this was in uh, part of that opportunity to rethink how we and the value of rethink the, the, the nature of, of remote working and I think if you're Sorry, not you add to that maybe a bit better no, no, Ed, I mean I'm I'm sure Tracy would probably give us a nice uh, snappy answer but no and there it, it's also go it's a social economy a social enterprise that was actually established before COVID and they it's an organization that, that they have chapters in many communities throughout Ireland that support people who are remote working but also act as as Gavin said as an advocate to promote remote working with firms um, and Tracy um, and John are both on our advisory and are really enthusiastic contributors and we we really value their take on on things because I think they were ahead of the game for so many uh, in terms of, of what's been happening over the last couple of years. Great, thank you, that's helpful. So uh, another question, um, and I just, well, I guess this could go to any of you. Did you come across people who were happy to go back to work in the office or workplace full time, not as a reflection on their place of residence, but because they missed the social interaction? Anyone here, anybody voice that opinion? That um that it was hasn't come out. Like, we haven't, I suppose, asked that specifically, but that hasn't been coming out either in the survey or the interviews. I think what people are appreciative of is the hybrid side of things because I think there is a recognition of fear of of isolation when it comes to work. So I think what's what's coming out for us around that theme is the flexibility that remote working is offering, be it a, a mix um, of, of approaches, but that specifically Adele hasn't really um, come up. Jesse, any feedback on that one? Yeah, I mean, there was one woman who said it was hard for her at first uh, <clears throat> to, you know, work from home because of the social aspect, but then she said that later she realized it was more efficient. Um, and I remember another man who just talked about that he prefers the office because he's an engineer, you know, and he likes to see how the products are physically that they're making. So, and he works one day a week remote. So there was kind of like Karen was saying, some flexibility. People were uh, appreciative of the flexibility and they wanted to maybe go into work sometimes but not all the time. I didn't see anyone who missed the five day work week. So as, as a, as a, as an anecdote of one, right. A sample of one, I moved about 45 minutes from campus uh, in the middle of the pandemic. And I'm dragging my feet every time that there's a meeting that I'm, that I'm being requested to, uh, to make that commute back to campus. So uh, my, my perspective is just the opposite. The, the, the less I need to go in uh, to campus, the better. So we got another question, uh, and this one asks, how would you... Just add to, to that, there's also, I think, 
not that we're finding in our data, um, but I, I think we'll share with what we're finding from the point from the advisory group and others that th there's potential here for what does emerge in terms of a, fi a, a, a final findings and the write up would be, and particularly it aligns with Grow Remote, for example, in terms of the benefits that people might have in terms of not working from home, as in telecommuting, but uh, teleworking or working remotely in a different environment than their home, but which is close to their place of residence. So again, this might throw up questions for rural revitalization and and and, and re reuse of existing urban environments within rural contexts. So again, that allows that social interaction to happen, uh, but it's not necessarily in, in the place of work um, as, as traditionally known. So there's things like that that we might be able to have, have or they might, the research data might show some policy directions towards that um, as well, which is worth maybe flagging. As we're social creatures, we do need that social interaction to some extent, but maybe we wanted that balanced with the long commute. Gavin, I've heard this come up in some of our conversations. And what I'm understanding is there might be places where people can go to to telecommute in a sense, right? I mean, do we have examples of that popping up in Ireland? Because I, I can't, Jesse can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't know that we've come across any of those kind of examples. Well, Jesse may well respond to that in terms of the US context, but yeah, it's definitely something that's um, happening in the island of Ireland, particularly in the Republic of Ireland. There's, there's uh, the idea of uh, um, sort of more hubs, remote hubs in rural environments. And so sort of that responds to this notion, I suppose, of wider um, decentralization and spreading organizations, obviously, outside of uh, core urban areas. But generally, the idea of these sort of have been emerging prior to COVID, but that has obviously expedited some of the conversations around that. That means I I couldn't wear my pajama pants, right? To to these no, no dress uh, code on these. Jesse, Jesse, we we come across this at all. Um, in the interviews, I didn't have anyone that talked to me about working somewhere else besides the home for remote mm -hmm. working. We did in the survey ask people, where have you worked in the past year, and we had them check you know boxes like a cafe, whatever, etc remote work hub, things like that. But I don't have that data in front of me, but out of 20 interviews, nobody talked to me about working somewhere else besides their actual place of residence. Okay. Um, so we have another question, a rather long one. So let, let me read it to you. I don't know if you folks, you can read the questions too, right, Karen? This one's sort of directed at you. To follow up on, on Dr. Kivney's question or answer, do you think that people are using the involvement in community groups like the GAA, which are central to people's identity as a justification slash driver on long distance commuting? And two, do you think that the self-reported nature of responses is missing a decline in involvement in other social involvement, which is less central to people's identity? That's a big one. I, I suppose I can, I don't know if I can answer the first part, to be honest. Um, I'm going to my interpretation of the first part is that people are stay are staying embedded in their communities because they want to be engaged with GA and are willing to commute. So I wouldn't I don't know the answer. Um, I obviously would have my own thoughts on it, but it'd be very anecdotal. What I would say in a broader sense. Um, and it's something we've we've just we've when we're analyzing the data is regard like bigger so than GAA, I think that people are willing to commute because they have a connection to the place. Um so and, and that was happening pre-COVID as well, except it was usually a five-day a week commute. So now like people were saying, well. My payoff is, yes, I may have to commute an hour, but I really, really like the place I live in and it's worth it for me. Um, so I, that's the, the sort of the closest I can get to any of that connection with, with the GAA. The second one, I, uh, Darren, I, I, I agree. I, I do think the self-reported nature of the responses are, they're of interest because we are booking the trend when we look at the literature in terms of volunteering. 
Um, it is volunteering nonetheless, so that's not to be sniffed at. But I, I do wonder, and my own area is rural community development, so I'm very familiar with levels of engagement and volunteerism. And we are finding since COVID drop offs and burnout in volunteering. But to be honest, that's also on a very cyclical basis. And it's something that's probably been happening for decades in, in various ways. But I do think that might hide some of the, 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 the levels of volunteering. Now, we do have questions there that break down that and I didn't go into everything today so we are when we're kind of doing more detailed analysis looking at where people are volunteering and whether it's more likely to be sports related versus something else like volunteering and meals and wheels or something like that but I think they're really really good points that I don't have a full answer to. <laughs> Again I'll just share my own example so having moved to this smaller town outside of Washington DC I volunteered to join the zoning Board of Appeals, right? Uh, but the great thing about that is I can walk to City Hall from where I live now, whereas if I had stayed in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area, it certainly would have been a you know, half hour to an hour commute, and I would not have volunteered uh, to serve on, on that kind of uh, commission. Anything you want to add, Jesse or Gavin? Nope. All right. Yeah, 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 sorry, just to carry, yeah, just I think to echo Karen's point, it's something that we're Particularly in the, in the Irish case studies, it's the where this social engagement volunteering is happening is crucial for us, and that's really going to be further explored in phase two because it's quite significant that we are bucking the trend, use that expression, or that we're actually seeing a, um, a difference in our findings in comparison to international literature. But I think it raises questions, particularly on a spatial dimension, when we're thinking about the application to this for a project that contribution might not necessarily be in the commuter settlement that they're based in. Uh, and so further reflection on where that volunteering is happening, because that might be adding to and enriching the community cohesion in another location, um, but not actually in that specific place of, of community and, and residence. So a um, lot of interesting questions to further unpack as we move, move forward. So uh, a response to uh, one of your points, Gavin, Local authorities are definitely looking at remote hubs, in quotes. It's something we have included as policy in Dublin's new development plan. So apparently this is a thing. At least it is in Ireland, right? Yeah, well, I'll qualify that in terms of, yes, in the Republic of Ireland, was it something in Northern Ireland? We are still I suppose, at very early stages in terms of even um, having a discourse or a dialogue around that. I think it's something that's further progressed and advanced, obviously, in the Republic of Ireland. Is that good there? From, um, mm -hmm. the and to to add, there's a, if for non, maybe people aren't familiar with, with it, there's a very good website, connectedhubs.ie, which shows all the digital and remote working hubs. And... Um, a lot of that is run out of the Western Development Commission, who are also on our advisory group as well. So we're very engaged with them um, in terms of the learnings from this, but and also uh, what they're doing as well, because they're leading the way with remote uh, hubs. Uh, to me, I find that very interesting because, like I said, you know, I mean, we have you know plenty of Starbucks around here, right, uh, and cafes and so forth, but but I've not seen. Right, any sort of publicly supported uh, remote hubs. It'll be interesting. Do you all know whether this is an Ireland phenomena or a European phenomena or a, a, or a Republic of Ireland phenomena, maybe, Gavin, what you were saying? Uh, how, how widespread are these things? And maybe, is it Adel who wrote this question? Maybe uh, he or she can uh, add a little bit more in, in, the, in the question and answer. It, it is a really strong policy for the Department for Rural and Community Development here. And coincidentally, when COVID, the pandemic began, that department were about to release their Our Rural Future strategy. That was paused and delayed and to a certain extent um, adapted to the changing circumstances. So that rural strategy came out in the middle of the pandemic and remote working hubs were seen as a key response for rural regeneration. I think we are yet to see where and how they will succeed. Um, it's, it's a kind of a living experiment. I think some are doing really well, depending on where they're located. Others, I do, you know, there's, there's mixed kind of 
numbers coming back because you know some people do want to sit with their pajamas on and work from home and also if you have the broadband for that then why not um so i think it also depends on where like wh- what people's jobs are um do they want to you know some people even though they want to they don't want the commute will still want to go into an office situation so um it's it's it is actually a really interesting time because it's become such a strong policy for our government but really we're only learning how that's impacting and i do think there's a really specific geography like even a lot of the talk we hear about it would be around particularly very scenic landscapes areas along the west coast of ireland where you've got somebody that can go and go on their holidays um and work you have a working holiday go to the remote set, working hub and still have their holiday and it's been promoted in that way i just don't know i think it'll be different how it works in in different parts of the country mm-hmm. interesting so on, on the other end, so to speak, um, there's a question that says, how would you see the information from the studies supporting the case for more comprehensive public transport service, particularly in rural areas? I don't know, should I come in again? <laughs> I, I've, I'm a bit of a rural person. Uh, I mean, like anything, I think it, 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 it hopefully i mean all our research is about creating evidence bases for for decision making so for transport we can see is coming out incredibly strongly and it's people are incredibly frustrated with transport but i think that's across urban and rural areas um the reason people so many so many people opt for their cars is because of ease now i do think cost of living and cost of running a car is changing how people are using their cars so I and generally you'll see in other research that's done, if transport was able to respond to need, then people would use it. So my hope would be um, that, you know, because we are working with government on this as well. So they're, they're, they, we are feeding hopefully into policy because we're providing evidence bases that there's a recognition that people do need high quality public transport in urban and rural places. And as well as that, walkable areas because actually rural areas tend to be less walkable they tend to be less safe to walk in and cycle in due to lighting and lack of paths so it's about looking at transport holistically um reduction of cars and increase in public transport and walkability and cyclability i don't know if that's a word um but i think it is about looking at it holistically and urban and rural areas as I see that you're in the in the group here uh, as our one of our fearless leaders, uh, can I lean on you to just make a few comments about where this is going? Hello, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thanks, Anne. Um, I, yeah, I was uh, uh, excavated there for a minute. Um, yeah. Well, uh, where it's going next, uh, Garrett, I suppose, is into phase two. Um, with the extension of the field work in Ireland into a further four towns. Um, and they are located in the commuter belts of Cork, Galway, uh, Dublin, and Belfast. Um, so we are going to be getting in a lot more data um, than we have just from what is reported today from phase one. Um, we're also going to be, I think, adjusting our um, data collection instruments quite a bit in the light of phase one experience. Uh, we're into a different kind of scenario now, really, I suppose, where there has been a return to something like normality uh, in the working environment. Um, whereas, you know, during phase one, uh, the, the survey was being run um, during the the restrictions brought about by the Omicron variant, a variant sorry, of, of COVID. Uh, so there was still quite a, a degree of restriction. Uh, that's pretty much gone now, could have, I suppose, returned, but uh, I don't think so. So we're really into you know, a, a new scenario now, I think post pandemic, hopefully, um, and a chance to, as I said, gather, gather a lot more data in you know, uh, different towns and different areas. So that's what's on the agenda now. Um, we probably have more questions and answers really arising out of phase one of the study. Um, 
the, the presenters have done a very good job of giving our findings as they are. Um, but you know, there are a lot of other issues that remain still uh, pretty much in the air. I think you know, Gavin talked about the issue of social capital in commuter towns. Um, we've found, well, our findings there are a little bit counterintuitive. We know now we've got to dig a lot deeper to try to unpack that because we had thought to begin with that that would be one of the main ways in which commuting would impact on commuter settlements. Uh, we're not so sure now that it is. So there's work to be done there. Uh, you were talking just a few minutes ago about the whole concept of remote working hubs. Um, and one of the things we've discovered we need to do for phase two is to really um, distinguish between home working and remote working. Um, and, and we don't have that clearly in the, the data from phase one. Uh, the two are kind of, uh, they're, they're conf conflated, I think. Um, but they're not necessarily the same thing. Um, home working is not necessarily the same as uh, remote working. So we need to kind of unpack that a little bit as well and see what uh, people's interest is in one versus the other. Some people may be very happy to work in a remote hub, but not at home, or indeed vice versa. Uh, the whole attraction of remote working might be to be at home. Um, so there's a lot there to be done still. Um, so just to conclude that, yes, we have, uh, I think we've made a good start on this. Um, we have certainly found some things that surprised us. Uh, we've found some things that we kind of expected to find as well. But um, there's a lot more to be done yet uh, with the, the second phase of the study to, to try to get um, a good handle on you know where we are and basically what we think the future of these commuter settlements might be uh, and what you know the future of the work that's in them or so the the, um, the 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 homework relationship uh, that that they represent what that future is um so uh, <laughs> to quote the famous uh, political slogan uh, a lot done but you know a lot more to do as well um with the, the project indeed like all good researchers, you end the project with the call for more research. Absolutely, yeah. That, that remain unanswered. Absolutely. Indeed. All right. Um, I see no more questions in the chat, and we are nearly at the end. You may get a minute or two back uh, of your afternoon or morning. But before that, let me thank you all for attending. I uh, certainly want to thank our presenters for, for the excellent presentations and Mary for chiming in. Uh, as I noted earlier, uh, all materials relating to this afternoon's event will be uh, available shortly on the ICLRD website, www.iclrd.org. Uh, I want to thank you for participating not only in this one, but in the entire series. Uh, I understand we have one more event to go as part of the series, and it's taking place on Wednesday, the 16th of November. I don't have a specific time. Maybe somebody can let me know, let the rest of the folks know, or if we don't know, we'll same, let... Same time, 3, 3 p.m. Irish time. Yeah, same time, same place. See you all there. <laughs> so with that, uh, thank you, uh, and I look forward to seeing you all again. Thanks, Karen. Thank you.